After three months, the Hawkeyes finally got their offensive coordinator. It's Tim Lester. Yeah, exactly. We break it down today, Locked On Hawkeyes. You are Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're available wherever you find podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Well, here we are, a new week, and yes, the news is now official. Iowa has an offensive coordinator. Tim Lester gets the job, former Western Michigan quarterback, a former Western Michigan head coach, and a guy that was in the NFL a year ago as an analyst with the Green Bay Packers. Not exactly an inspiring hire, uh, not a name that makes people hopeful. I don't think that we're going to see a whole lot of innovation that the hope that this was going to lead to some kind of big evolution from this squad and and what this team has done, certainly as the offense has cratered over the last couple of seasons. I think that excitement's gone. And it felt like it was down to two guys. Uh, We talked about both these guys a week ago. And Kevin Johns, of the two, definitely had the more intriguing resume. He was a guy that had been a play caller at a number of different places. He'd worked under a bunch of different systems. The reason that I was so excited about a guy like Kevin Johns is he was a guy that adapted to certain styles and had done it in a myriad of different ways. From Indiana, uh, working with Kevin Wilson, one of the most most brilliant offensive minds you're going to find in college football, Uh, His ability to run that power spread offense was something I thought that was certainly intriguing at Iowa. What he did at Duke, even this year, as their offense certainly took a step back, but that was because their quarterback went down to Riley Leonard. Even with that, they won a big game with their third string quarterback. They they at least gave themselves a chance and they evolved and they changed on the fly, losing what some people believe is a really good and a, a chance at a pro quarterback and Riley Leonard. And he was able to do that. And He's done the spread, was with Cliff Kingsbury for a year. He's been all over the place. And he has a background in the power structure of being a coordinator that has done some good things. You don't have that with Tim Lester. Now, he was a head coach. And if you become a head coach, and he's head coach a couple of times, he's a head coach uh, down to small level football as a 27-year-old, and then went back to his alma mater and became the head coach there, and certainly had successes. His offenses, for the most part, were good. The last year, cratered. Okay, it was a rebuilding year. New AD came in, got him out of there. But the offenses were successful. The reason that Tim Lester, on the surface, to me is not a real inspiring hire. It's just that. It's just kind of more of the same. Not a whole lot of excitement. Kind of unremarkable, uninspiring. I mean, it's already going to be out there, right? Lackluster and lackluster. That's... (laughs) Headline kind of writes itself, right? And that's what you get with Tim Lester. There just isn't a whole lot of meat to the resume. We talked about this a lot. And really, over the last year, as we're seeing more and more the evolution of college football and what it's becoming, it's no longer a power five. Well, there's not going to be five after the season completes. After the school year ends and softball and baseball are done, it'll be power four. But really, it's a power two. And Iowa is part of the power, too. Now, there are only 34 offensive coordinator jobs in the power, too. And it wasn't a thought that people were going to be beating down their door to get to Iowa. It certainly has not been a destination job for an offensive coordinator since, what, Bill Snyder was here back in the 80s? I mean, it's, it's a long time ago. The last three hires now were Tim Lester. He was targeted to go to Troy. That's where he was heading. He was going to the Sun Belt. Okay. Before that, Brian Ferentz, who didn't have anybody beating down his door to call plays, and you saw the reason for that. Before that, you had not to work Greg Davis. 
Again, not exactly awe-inspiring candidates here. In fact, is there another Power 2 program? And you can throw Northwestern and Vanderbilt and the also Rands. Would anybody hire any of these guys? And would any of the other 33 programs hire Tim Lester to be their offensive coordinator? In a successful program. In a program that has stability. In a program that has hope and has a great defense and special teams and has so many positives working for it. Would anybody else make this hire? I don't think so. Is that because Kirk Ferentz is smarter than everybody else? I don't think that either. He went safe. He went somebody that probably used the buzzwords that got him excited. And here we are. And how did we get to this point? Now, that's another frustrating aspect about this. As we wait 90 days and we're served up Tim Lester. Again, it's not about the guy. It's about the way this thing played out. Kirk, kicking and screaming, saw his boy get fired. And didn't like it. And he said as much. And you understand that. Now you understand that from both the family relationship and the in-season relationship. But you also have to remember that Kirk did this to himself. He was not forced to give his boy a job as offensive coordinator when he did not, did not have the resume or the background to be a play caller. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. And when you choose to do things like that, and you do have bosses above you, they can make things uncomfortable for you. And that's what they did. There is not a doubt in my mind. If Beth Getz did not step in in October and fire Brian Ferentz, that Brian would be back next season. You heard Kirk complain about the injuries and making the excuses. You know the way this would have played out. I don't think there is a doubt he would have tried his damnedest to do it. Look how he handled this. He knew for three months this was going to happen. And when Paul Chris told him no, he didn't have background. He didn't know where to go. And that's how you come up with this poo-poo platter of guys that don't have jobs or have a job lined up in the Sun Belt. How that happens, it's Kirk Ferentz. It's the control that he wants. Unremarkable uninspiring. That's where we are today. I preferred Kevin Johns because of what he had did. Tim Lester, you got a lot in front of you. So what's this going to look like? What is Iowa football and what's the offense going to do? What needs to be done to get them even to a competent level? Instead of having an offensive coordinator that was right there, down to the final two, that put together offenses, game plan, called plays, and a bunch of different systems, in the power structure, you get a Mac flame out. We'll see if it works. I'm not confident. What's it going to look like? We'll get into that as we continue. We do have some positivity. Don't worry. Good weekend on the hoop side of things. We'll talk men's and women's basketball as well as we continue. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Trent Condon back with you once again on the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We got hoops coming up for you and uh, some good feelings as Iowa goes on the road on the men's side, gets a win back in Carver. Taylor Swift day for the women's team as they coast in the victory against Nebraska and uh, a little more in depth. And of course, there's there's always something, right? Always fireworks when it pertains to women's basketball. We'll get into that here momentarily, but we continue to dive down the decision of Kirk Ferentz coming up with Tim Lester 
to run the offense. Now, one thing people say, and I was trying to talk myself into some positivity about the hire. All right, he was with the Packers. Now, he wasn't an on-field coach. He was a guy that was out of work, and Matt LaFleur, who, in fact, was the backup quarterback to him at Western Michigan, gave him a job. It's an analyst job, not on the field coaching, but an analyst. Okay, well, he's learning from LaFleur, who is highly competent as a play caller and what we've seen from him as head coach. That's good. Not one problem. Oh, look, Jordan Love, look at his ascension this year. I mean, the improvements that guy made over the back half of the year, all those young wide receivers, you get, you're excited. Or maybe talking yourself into this. Okay. Uh, then read a little deeper. And Tim Lester, yes, he was an analyst with the Green Bay Packers. He was a defensive analyst. He was breaking down what other teams were going to be doing on the offensive side and then relaying that to the defense. Okay. Uh, some of the excitement went there. Hey, here's one positive for you. We can probably keep betting unders and feel pretty good about it uh, coming up next season on FanDuel. We got that going for us. And we'll be able to jump aboard with that. What's it going to look like? So RPO, run pass option. And sometimes you hear that term. You hear, all right, an RPO-based offense, and you're thinking running quarterback because, well, run pass option, and that's you kind of think that way with the option part. It's not always the case. And you look at you know, Minnesota, what, five, six years ago when Tanner Morgan was really playing well. He's not a guy that was going to beat you with his legs, but it was a ton of RPO. And the RPO gives the ability to get the ball to the running back and a lot of easy passes out of it. One thing we do know is this passing offense needs to be completely redone. And what it is morphed into over the last couple of years, and you can argue that it was quarterback play. I mean, we went from Spencer Petras feeling like well, you can't find a worse quarterback play than what we got certainly over the final two years of Spencer Petras. It can't be worse than that. Well, we got handed a banged-up Cade McNamara, and then after he eventually went down with the torn ACL, we were served up Deacon Hill. And if there's a worse quarterback that's played in the power structure over the last decade, i like to see him because I can't remember watching him, and I watch a ton of football. Woof. So is this Marco Lyoness? Is this Cade McNamara? Is this an offense that you're comfortable with? Oh, and what are the feelings inside the walls of Fort Kinnick? Now, I wonder how this is being handled by the players. Obviously, they respect Kirk Ferentz. I think we should all respect the job that he has done. I have never been a proponent of getting the old man out of here, that he's lost his touch. But these last 90 days, the way this was handled and what came out of the backside of it has me questioning even more. I believe that he's in a position that he should be able to go out, not whenever he wants, but if he could continue playing high-level football, that he could kind of write his final script. And I was thinking that with the right hire here, this final script could be pretty dang good. We talk about this upcoming season, 2024. Even with the new look Big Ten and the Big Ten West going away, it's not a very daunting schedule in comparison to what a lot of the other teams, certainly in the conference, are going to have this year. But there was a real possibility. Is Tim Lester a guy that's going to be able to implement something very quickly? With the RPO based system, are they going to be able to do that over 15 spring practices? And then August camp, and you're going to be able to see the full look. If you go back and you remember when Greg Davis took over, there were some ugly moments. I relay the story before, and I'll tell you again if you missed it. At halftime, looking over at my buddy, we're watching the game at Soldier against Northern Illinois and saying, I hate the Greg Davis offense. It didn't marry. It didn't work. You had a returning starting quarterback in James Vandenberg that had thrown 27 touchdowns the year before in the final year at Ken O'Keefe. He threw seven next year. It just woof. It takes a while to implement a new system. And yes, this is going to be a new system. I mean, enough with the, it's just Kirk's offense because it isn't. Watch Ken O'Keefe's offense. Watch Greg Davis's. Watch the baby boys. Baby Huey. They're all different. Doesn't make them good, but they're all different. They're all things that are a change. How much is he going to be able to implement what he wants to do? That's what we have to know. We will see how this eventually plays out. 
it's difficult to get excited about it. I'm going to continue to break it down. You know, you go back to his time at Syracuse. That was a disaster. He took over play calling duties about halfway through his first year. He wasn't good. Second year was an improvement. Still 113th in the country in offense. That's a yikes. I mean, the only time that you got to see him in a power structure, it went that bad. He was a quarterback coach at Purdue for one season when Daryl Hazel was a head coach at Purdue. In that season, David Blau, guy was a pretty good quarterback, threw 21 interceptions that year. Uh, again, these are just points on the resume. Could it work? Sure. A lot of things can work, but it doesn't instill hope. It's not about us. It's not about hope for the fan base. It's about these players buying in. It's about a system that can work. He probably said that they play complimentary football and that got Kirk all excited and away we went. I don't know. I don't know how you can look at the two resumes between Kevin Johns and Tim Lester and come up with Lester. I don't know how they interview. But I'm also just keep coming back to this was it. After three months, these were your final two. After you're told no, yes, Paul Chris said no. We know that. Chris said no. That's the thing that's just befuddling me. I mean, you look around the country, you look at when a place like, I don't know, a South Carolina. Well, hell, look at what Northwestern did this year. Northwestern went out and they got a young, innovative offensive coordinator that put up a ton of points and won a national championship at South Dakota State. Was it Luan, I think, is the uh, last name of the OC, formerly with the Jackrabbits and now at Northwestern. Did Kirk pick up the phone? Probably not, because that thing was done in December. It was... It's a disservice, and I understand. Yes, it would be a disservice to your current players if you are spending time on that when you can get ready for bull prep. We saw that bull prep was a bunch of garbage, too. This is tough. This is a tough one. It really is. And even looking for those silver linings, there's not a whole lot of them. We'll continue to dig. Help me out. Hit us up on the comment section on YouTube. Hit us up on Twitter. Let us know. Where can we find some silver lining? Because I am struggling to find it. So let's talk about some positives. Let's talk some hoops. We'll do that as we continue. A little hoops conversation. Nice road win for the men's team. Now they got to continue. Uh, wins need to continue to pile up and bouncing back after a loss for the women's team. We'll talk some basketball as we come back here. Locked on Hawkeyes. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. So many different games going on. So many different props that you can get involved with. You got the commercials. You got the food. Got to get some wings, right? You got to have everything. And, of course, we get a good game with the Chiefs and the Niners. I mean, that's pretty compelling. Get to see George Kittle. Got to love that part of it. We got the local connections. And uh, if you're in the Midwest here, well, there's a little something else with the Chiefs. And, of course, somebody that's probably going to be in the booth. We'll uh, take a little deeper look at things. Uh, I'll tell you right away, I jumped aboard as soon as the line came out. Got the Chiefs, got that field goal. Not there anymore as the bets are piling in on Kansas, Kansas City. FanDuel, they have so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three or even more than that. Not only can you bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl and Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets which player will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers, join today. You'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Trent Connor back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We got you covered here across the Locked On Network. Locked On, your team every day. Your favorite NFL, MLB. That's right. Pitchers and catchers going to be reporting here in just a couple of weeks. NBA, NHL. We got Locked On Big Ten. Locked On College Football. Locked On College Basketball. Locked On Bets. Everything that you could imagine under one roof across the Locked On Network. Basketball, 
went well. Let's go in order here as the women got the win uh, first on Saturday afternoon against Nebraska. You know, there were some shaky moments early in that game, some moments where, hey, maybe Nebraska's going to hang around. But, well, it's always been the case. Caitlin starts to get hot, knocking down some big three. She finishes with 38 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists in the game, and shoots a sterling from the three-point line, 8 of 15. She was incredible. Uh, another nice game from Kate Martin. You know, she's playing inside a lot, staffing, uh, stuffing the stat sheet, uh, doing a lot of little things, not just the 16, but five rebounds, four assists, uh, helping out in a myriad of different ways in there. A falter, again, off the bench, she was really good. My excitement, though, level, it's a player that we've talked about quite a bit here, was Taylor McCabe coming in, knocking down some shots from the outside. I, I still think she needs to be a bigger part of this rotation. In a game where Molly Davis didn't do a whole lot, Gabby Marshall looks like that shot's off a little bit more. Uh, obviously, I need to get her going on the offensive end of the floor. But 92-73, coast into the victory and a cover on top of it. Caitlin doing her thing. Uh, there was some pushing, some shoving. She gets bounced around the floor all over the place. There's going to be frustration. We know that's the way Caitlin's wired. I mean, she's she's a time bomb, right? And she's always ticking and always waiting and has something to say with the officials and things like that. But little extras uh, sometimes, a stop and kind of push back into the player. Look, that's Caitlin Clark. It's kind of all part of it, right? And what makes her tick, what makes her the player that she is, uh, there's going to be moments that can be a little bit uncomfortable, and that's okay. As Hawkeye fans, we can say that. If there's a line cross, you can say that and still love the team. But they don't take away your fan card if you say things like that. It's okay. And Caitlin, we know when she goes on the road, it's going to be, everybody's going to be there, want to get a glimpse of her. We, we've seen that continue here. You look at this week, Wednesday, when they go to Northwestern. And the Northwestern team is not very good. Uh, they got throttled by Indiana today. Almost got doubled up in that game. They're bad. I got the ticket prices to get into Welsh Ryan are through the roof. Not for Northwestern women's basketball, but for Caitlin. And then next Saturday, a road trip out to Maryland. You know, Brenda Free, she's going to have a game plan, and they're going to be clutching and grabbing and holding and, and doing their thing. She's going to have to have her head screwed on for that one because Maryland, they play it physical, and they're going to be rough with you, and you got to be ready to play through that one. Nice win, though, bouncing back after the loss against Ohio State. Probably a good time to recalibrate, uh, get some get some extra rest, get out there, and now it really goes. And, and the grind's going to continue here really through the rest of the season. They do have another mini-buy, if you will, before the Indiana game. as They'll be off for a week uh, before that one towards the uh, middle of February. But a lot of games coming up, two uh, back-to-back each and every week over the next couple of weeks. Road trips to Maryland. Nebraska, those are going to be pretty tough. Penn State's playing better. Uh, that's in between the Maryland and the Nebraska game. So a little bit more difficult after this one against Northwestern coming up this week. On the men's side of things, what a turnaround uh, from the men's team after just a terrible loss to Maryland earlier in the week. Uh, Maryland team that's not good. Um, that's just not. You can't lose that game at home. But let them hang around. Didn't deliver the knockout blow. And that was kind of the story of that first game against Michigan where they were ripe for the picking and just getting blown out of the building, but I couldn't do it, and here we are. 88-78. So they're down in this game pretty big late in the first half. What, three and a half minutes to play, something like that. They're down double digits, and like, well, any hope that we had for this team going to be off the board, and, and they suck you back in right the way they start knocking down shots. Sanford was incredible, uh, hitting shots from all over the place. Really liked what we saw out of him. Obviously, the play inside from Owen Freeman, he was really, really solid. Uh, the physicality that he played up really stood and stayed out of foul trouble, and that has to be a piece, too. Iowa, for the game, puts up 1.26 points per possession. That's elite. The offense looked kind of as we expect. The offense is supposed to look for Iowa, and they run away and get the victory. Uh, Tony Perkins, boy, this young man. Uh, TP has always been one of my favorites. When he showed up on campus, there was just something about him, and they could unlock him. You know, there's a lot of guys like Tony Perkins, guys that are a little undersized, have a little something that's just don't have the complete game, if you will. And Fran McCaffrey's done a great job of maybe giving us the best version of Tony Perkins that you could ever have. Like He's a guy that early in his career it could have gone close to home, could have gone to the Horizon League or the MVC, something like that, found a home and put up good numbers in a mid-major. 
and said he stuck it out and he's going to be an all big 10 player, you know, third team, probably something like that. Honorable mention. He's, he's got a lot out of obviously the skills that he has really good to see and a good kid. That's uh, really fun to see him playing at a high level. Uh, Dix did some good things. I thought on the floor too, we got to see back uh, Patrick McCaffrey was out there. Not a great day from him uh, from the floor. Dembali though, getting him back out. That was a great thing. And then we just kind of continue to wait. Uh, what's going to happen with the young point guards? We're going to see more from Harding or for Bowen. Doesn't appear that's going to be the case. Kind of this is the team. This is who they are. It's going to be that that five that you're kind of used to now with Dix in the starting lineup alongside Perkins. Sanford keeps shooting the ball, though. I think got a chance. Look, it, it can't just end with this, though. As they inch their way back to Mount 500. Indiana, Hoosiers are playing bad. This is a bad basketball team. They've lost three straight, four of their last five. The only win in there was at home against Minnesota. You know, that's not a good gopher team. They get beat by Illinois over the weekend. They got absolutely bludgeoned uh, against Wisconsin before that. Blown out by Purdue. There's another one that's right there for Iowa. I mean, a very winnable game. Then you're home for Ohio State. Uh, that will be on Friday night before Penn State on the road. Winnable, Minnesota. And then you get the return trip to Maryland. And maybe you can return the favor, much like you just did against Michigan here. Probably in that stretch, though, we're talking about over the next five. You still got to win four out of five. And you do that, you win four out of your next five. That's going to get you to eight and six. But the closing stretch, whew, here's how they close. Home for Wisconsin. Great. At Michigan State. That doesn't go well. At Illinois. Neither is that. Home for Penn State. Good. At Northwestern. Northwestern's killing everybody that comes in there. And then home for Illinois. Whew. Yeah, that's how it finishes. Keep piling up the wins. We'll see if they can do it Tuesday night against Indiana. We'll break that game down a little bit more tomorrow on Locked On Hawkeyes. Thanks again for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We'll continue to dig into Tim Lester, see if there's anything to get excited about. Help me out. Anything that you can do. It was a safe choice. Uninspiring. Here we are. We're with you each and every day throughout the course of the week. Monday through Friday, your team every day. That's what we do here on the Locked On Network, and we do it for you on the Locked On Hawkeyes. A hey, Locked On has also launched the first ever national sports 24 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Back with you tomorrow. We got a lot going on here on the Lockdown Network. LaShawn Daniels also going to join us later in the week. Former Hawkeye running back will get his thoughts on the new OC. Can an RPO-based system work for the Hawkeyes? We'll break that down and a whole lot more. Thanks for being with us. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Go Hawks.